Hello everybody, Nate the Gamer here. It's strange thinking that I've been collecting retro games for about 10 years at this point. I still remember my first retro game console, a Jungle Green Nintendo 64. Speaking of 64-bit consoles, today's review is going to be on the Atari Jaguar. Released in 1993, this was Atari's last-ditch effort to get back into the console market after the Atari Lynx failed. At the time, there was fierce competition. Nintendo had the Super Nintendo, Sega had the Megazord of add-ons, the Genesis, 32X, and Sega CD, and the 3DO company had the 3DO. I know, creative name. Unfortunately, the Jaguar didn't save Atari from its demise. There were a lot of things that were going against it. Mismanagement from Atari's CEO, lack of first and third party support, and the eventual arrival of the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation. So pretty much the Jaguar was a death sentence for Atari. Did it deserve such a fate? Let's find out. It's often debated whether or not the Atari Jaguar is really 64-bit, and the reason for that is the technical specs. In an article published in the Electronic Gaming Monthly, Atari stated that it is 64-bit because of the two 32-bit processors, Tom and Jerry. Both chips do their separate thing. Tom handles the textures and polygons, while Jerry makes the CD quality, audio, sound effects, and music. And when these two work in tandem, they create a 64-bit architecture. Honestly, that does not make any sense. If we were to also throw in the Motorola 6800 that links the two chips together, we would get 80 bits. I personally thought that this was the real reason why it was considered 64-bit. There's actually more to the picture. There's the object processor that basically just displays video output from the system, the blitter, which helps with some depth perception and advanced shading, and the memory bus, which allows the 2 megabytes of RAM and the CPU to communicate with each other much faster. So from a marketing standpoint, they advertise the whole console as 64-bit to make it sound more enticing to the consumer. I mean, advertising your console as very fast in terms of accessing data sounds pretty boring. And while this sounds pretty much unheard of, NEC also did this with the TurboGrafx-16. It has an 8-bit CPU, but the graphics processor is 16-bit. Unfortunately, due to how the Atari Jaguar is built, developers could not take advantage of its 64-bit parts. Most of the time, developers mostly focus their attention on either Tom or Jerry, or they throw both of those aside and focus on the Motorola 6800, which was mostly found in consoles like the Sega Genesis and Neo Geo. So while the Atari Jaguar is a 32-bit based machine, it still stays true to its title of the first 64-bit machine due to those three parts. Special thanks to Genovi for lending me some of his knowledge on this subject, because trying to find information in these really long forum posts on what makes the Atari Jaguar 64-bit is really confusing. I'm actually starting to form a headache from all this technical jargon, so give me a second. I need to go grab some Advil. Pills here! Alright, let's talk about the controller. The controller is kind of bad. It's comfortable in my hands, but it's a little bit chunky. There's three face buttons, C, B, and A. The D-pad is pretty stiff and very slippery. And there's a number pad. Why is there a number pad? At least a lot of the Atari Jaguar games came with base plates that tell you what the buttons did. But every single controller that was out at that point had only face buttons. There was no such thing as a number pad anymore. To my understanding, at the end of the Atari Jaguar's life, there was a six button pro controller that was released, but it was in very limited quantities, which would have helped with a couple games. Speaking of games, let's talk about some because hardware isn't everything, right? Right? Cybermorph was the pack and title for the Atari Jaguar. You are given a handful of planets to explore, and the main objective is to find all of the energy pods on said planet. The draw distance is bad, and textures are pretty much non-existent. The controls are pretty bad as well. The game saves your progress by having you punch in a passcode on the number pad. And there's actually a bunch of hidden worlds. I tried to access one of them, and I died instantly. Yeah, the commercial is kind of right. This game is starting to make me feel sick. Wolfenstein 3D. Also known as the first person shooter that was overshadowed by Doom a year later. In this game, you play as William B.J. Blaskovich, and you have to infiltrate the Nazi regime. You traverse through maze-like levels, and you shoot down Nazis. Overall, for being one of the first first person shooters out there, it's not that bad. This version of Wolf 3D has all of the levels, two new weapons, including a flamethrower and a rocket launcher, 
And, as you can probably tell from this footage, it's all uncensored, unlike the Super Nintendo version, which was based off of this one. It also runs in full screen with a pretty solid frame rate. Overall, a pretty solid port from id Software. Club Drive, not to be confused with Drive Club, one of the PlayStation 4's best-selling titles, is a game that actually has a plot, in the instruction manual, of course. It's set in an amusement park in 2098, where driving became legalized after being deemed illegal for safety reasons. But like the plot matters anyways, because this game is kind of bad. It's a game where you drive around and you collect power orbs. Sound familiar? It's literally just Cybermorph, but instead you're in a car. The car physics are pretty bad, and the controls are very slippery. At least the draw distance is pretty far. Avoid this game like a pothole in the middle of the road. Hey, you guys remember when I reviewed Doom for the 32X? Well, this is the grandfather of all Doom ports. Developed in-house by id Software, Doom came out a year after the PC's release. While the levels are still shrunken down, the levels that are missing in the 32X version are here. The game runs in full screen and has a pretty nice frame rate too. Unfortunately, since there's a lack of face buttons on the Jaguar controller, you can't easily strafe out of the way, and trying to strafe out of doorways is still a major issue. Another thing this port is notable for is its lack of music during gameplay. Now, originally, I said in my 32X review that it doesn't have music because it uses the same processor found in the Genesis. That is a completely wrong statement. As it turns out, id Software only used the Jerry processor. So shame on me for getting all the technical jargon wrong. But hey, at least the sound effects sound good. And also, you can just put in your own music. So it's all cool. Another thing to note about this version of Doom is actually online co-op play. That's right, if you get a Jaglink cable, another Atari Jaguar with a copy of Doom, and a friend, you can play through the Doom campaign together. That's pretty revolutionary. Overall, while it's still not a definitive port of Doom, it's at least interesting to know where a lot of these ports came from. It's almost like a patient zero of all the shrunken down levels. Checkered Flag. Oh god, why? Checkered Flag is a racing game if the person who developed it looked at Virtua Racing and went, hmm, yeah, I see what Sega's trying to do with this game, but you want to know what would be better? Let's just make the game broken, because why not? The frame rate is pretty atrocious, and the controls are just bad. What's with all the car-related games being terrible on this console? Tempest 2000. Finally, an exclusive that's actually worth talking about. This is the classic Atari game, but with a very nice facelift. In this game, you play as a yellow... thing? As you shoot down yellow projectiles and avoid being dragged down to the void. While Tempest 2000 controls okay, games like this work really well with a dial controller. Surprisingly enough, there are a group of modders that manage to put a dial in the Jaguar controller. Man, these guys in the retro community really want their authentic experience. Overall, this is a really fun game and a must-have if you actually want to get an Atari Jaguar. Kasumi Ninja Kasumi Ninja was Atari's answer to Mortal Kombat. Unlike Mortal Kombat, a game that has memorable casts of characters, Kasumi Ninja has none. Okay, actually, there's two memorable characters. The Native American that stomps everywhere, and the Scottish guy that shoots fire out of his crotch. Yep, I just said that. The game's sluggishness is clear right as you reach the character select screen. Instead of having this normal layout where you get to select the portraits of your characters, you have to select their statue in this very laggy first-person segment. And you're stuck with this very generic ninja character. The only way you can actually unlock more fighters is to actually fight them in the single-player mode. The combat is very sluggish, not on the levels of the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat, but it's up there. The fact that there's only three face buttons on the Jaguar controller make combat a chore. You know what, it's one of those games though that it's so bad that it's kind of fun to look at and sort of play. I don't know, if you actually get this game, grab a friend, drag them into the room, and force them to play this game with you. Iron Soldier. I have no idea what I'm doing here. It feels like I'm a Power Ranger, but instead of doing awesome robotic kung fu moves, I'm driving a large tank into buildings. Bubsy and Fractured Furry Tales. God damn it, this guy's here too. This time, Bubsy travels into many fairy tales like Alice in Wonderland and Jack and the Beanstalk. For some reason, Bubsy's shirt has a yellow exclamation mark instead of red. Apparently this was a programming mistake that was ignored, so that should signify the quality of this game. The platforming is pretty bad, and the hit detection is awful. At least Rob Paulson reprised his role as Bubsy after Bubsy 2 and the cartoon. And to end things off, here is Alien vs Predator. This was the Atari Jaguar's killer app. You can play as either a Xenomorph, 
a Predator, or a Marine. And no, before you ask, this is not the Capcom classic that has not been ported to any console, but rather a mediocre first-person shooter. Yeah, if I'm being honest, I came into this game with way too high of hopes. Unlike Doom, which doesn't have any background music, there's a background hum that plays throughout the entire game. Also, there's this hilarious one voice clip from the Marine. What on earth got a hold of this guy? While the controls don't feel too terrible, I feel as though as the combat is kind of boring. Also, the level design isn't as interesting as Doom. If you're gonna get this game, play it before you play Doom, because you will be spoiled. Well, that was a little bit of a disappointment. Unfortunately, I couldn't look at all of the titles on the Atari Jaguar, mostly because they were either released in very limited quantities or the demand is so big that it's really expensive. Some of these titles include Rayman, Flashback, NBA Tournament Edition, and Missile Command 3D. Surprisingly, a CD add-on was released for the Jaguar in 1995. However, it didn't really last very long. There were only 13 games for it, and it didn't really add anything else apart from using a CD. It's hard to find, especially in working order. Now, you may think that the Jaguar just died and faded into obscurity, but you're wrong. In the late 90s, Hasbro bought out the entirety of Atari's assets, released the patents to the public, and turned the Atari Jaguar into an open platform. Now there's a nice sizable group of people that make homebrew games for the Jaguar. I wish I could cover some of them, but they're either released again in very limited quantities, or the flashcards that they make for it are really expensive. The molds for the Jaguar were also used for dentist equipment, believe it or not, and the Coleco Chameleon dumpster fire that happened in 2016. So overall, the Jaguar's legacy kind of lives on. It's a bit complicated. It's depressing to see Atari fall from grace. What was once a growing video game company in the 70s turned into a laughing stock in the 90s. There were a lot of bad choices that were made during this time, and it shows. The internal design of the Jaguar, the controller, the marketing, and overall just a lack of direction. And the one game that does stick out from the rest, which is Tempest 2000, is only one of 49 other games. I only recommend this console if you are a retro game collector or a really big Atari fanboy. I guess some of the positive things I can say about the Jaguar is the cool console design, the birth of a couple series that are actually still going on today like Rayman, and the controller actually works, unlike the 5200. Now if you excuse me, I have to go modify my Atari Jaguar to not only fit a Super Nintendo Junior inside, but also give me a root canal. Thank you guys so much for watching my video. If you guys are new and you've enjoyed what you've seen, go ahead and subscribe. Be sure to follow me on Twitter to see any shenanigans that I've gotten into and updates on the channel. But anyways, I'm Nate the Gamer, and I'll see you guys in the next video.